his face <laughs> to hear that again. I had to tell them as I often do, I'm not recommending that, it's just my testimony. <laughs> um, as he mentioned, my father passed away when um, I was 16 years old, a year later, at the age of 17, I was called to pastor that church. And in the providence of God, um, I stumbled over a few books that was introducing me to exposition of and then heard two men do it. Uh, a white pastor locally, uh, John MacArthur, and then a black pastor who had come to town, E.K. Bailey. Mm -hmm. And it just sealed the deal that I would spend my life pursuing expositional preaching. Uh, I served that church uh, in Los Angeles for almost 18 years. And uh, till the Lord drug me from home, kicking and screaming to Jacksonville uh, 14 years ago. And now he'd have to drag me kicking and screaming from Jacksonville, where I had the privilege of serving there. And still, uh, I believe that the primary ministry function of the pastor is uh, stated succinctly in 2 Timothy 4 to preach the word. Our work is more than preaching. I don't need to tell you that. But all of our work is to be rooted in the preaching of God's word. And so I'm glad to be able to talk to you a little bit about expositional preaching. Um, I just kind of wanted to kind of just make my case about the dynamics of exposition. Um, Mitch keeps mentioning how to do it. Uh, that's particular thing is not in that outline that you have, but I'm gonna steal away and just talk to you about my process at some point along the way. But we'll just we'll just plunge in and uh, let me let me bow first and then we'll we'll talk. Father in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this Monday morning together and for you orchestrating the circumstances of life to bring us together and for us to fellowship around truth and to sharpen our skills and handling your word week in and week out. We pray that you would guide our time. We pray that you will, Lord, uh, help us to pick up a couple of principles that'll help us in our own work and renew our commitment to give you our best as workers who have no need to be ashamed because we write and have the word of truth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort complete patience and teaching, of course. In the next verses, there are more exhortations he will give. Uh, I think in this passage, going through verse five, there's nine pieces of instruction that uh, Paul gives. And I think all of it is just, all of those nine imperatives really represent the exposition and application of that first command at the top of verse two. Sure. And just by, by way of uh, reference and passing, verse one puts the gravity of the presence of the Godhead, the final judgment, the second coming, the consummation of the kingdom. He puts all that weight on Timothy's shoulder before he gives his exhortation. Well, what would be so important that he would call down the Godhead, the second coming, the judgment, the kingdom on Timothy's shoulders? Well, if you could exegete the white spaces with me for just a moment, he doesn't tell him to lead the meetings and organize the programs and build the buildings. 
All of those things may have their inevitable place in the life and work of the pastor teacher. But I believe that the primary work for which we will have to answer at the Bema Seat of Christ is how we handle the Word of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So preaching matters. I believe preaching matters. I was asked in a setting not too long ago, what did I think of uh, the um, new notions of, of discipleship through worship that downplays the role of preaching. And I nodded and mumbled to give myself a moment because I had not heard of that. <laughs> uh, and I, found, I took a moment to give myself a, a polite way to respond. Um, but but there is no New Testament discipleship model that downplays the role of preaching in the corporate assembly of God's people. Uh, media, arts, or whatever else cannot replace the centrality of the preaching of God's word. For the purpose of biblical, biblical literacy, we need, we need to preach. People, we live in a day of increasing biblical illiteracy. Do you agree with that? Amen. Uh, for spiritual transformation, we we must we must preach. Preaching of God's word is the means by which the Lord saves the lost and sanctifies the church. And 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 by divine authority, we must preach. Uh, on the way here from the airport a little while ago, uh, Mitch was sharing with me some E.B. Hill stories, and uh, I trumped him. I told him I have the best E.B. Hill story, and I do. Uh, I was called to pastor my, 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 my dad's church at the age of 17 years old, and uh, E.B. Hill preached my installation. And in typical E.B. Hill fashion, he did preliminary remarks for 25 minutes. <laughs> and uh, then when he finally got down to, to business, he said, now nah, tonight I want to talk from the subject, what can that boy tell me? <laughs> That's the word going around town. He's only 17 years old. What can that boy tell me when my marriage is in trouble? What can that boy tell me when my child is going straight. And for 45 minutes, uh, Dr. Hill talked about the sufficiency of scripture. Amen. And his concluding point was that that boy can tell you whatever the word of God tells him to tell you. Amen. 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 That's a good way to set up a new ministry. Isn't it? That does Scripture is true whether I experience it or not. And our authority is not in our experience. It is not in our gifting. It is not in our eloquence. It's not in our education or training. Uh, the only authority with which we have to preach is the authority of thus. May the Lord give us a new generation of preachers who are just not embarrassed to, to just say in the words of Billy Graham simply, the Bible says. Amen. Amen. The Bible says. And let that be our authority. Preaching matters. And not only does preaching matter, but exposition matters. So the exhortation in 2 Timothy 4 2 is significant because note that he does not just tell Timothy that he must preach, he also tells Timothy what he must preach. You, you don't have editorial authority to determine the message. The message has been predetermined. You must preach the word. It is the duty of the herald. If the king sent the herald 
and the people dismissed him. Uh, to dismiss the message of the herald would be to dishonor the authority of the king. But at the same time, the herald must be careful not to misinterpret or misrepresent the king's message because that's just as dangerous. We have been entrusted with the message that we are to faithfully proclaim. We are to preach the word. In fact, that's my case for expositional preaching. My elevator answer when I am asked why expository preaching. If we were on an elevator, had three floors, and I'd have just a few seconds to tell you why expository preaching, my simple elevator answer is because 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 come right after 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God. Yeah. Thus, 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, preach the word. Here's my conviction. Expositional preaching is not about a style of sermon. It's about a view of scripture. Right. How you preach inevitably betrays how you view scripture. If all scripture is breathed out by God, why are you running around trying to find something to say? <laughs> Preach the word. Preach the word. Reminds us that it is not the function of preaching that has power. Yeah. It's the content of the preaching. Right. Or if I could say it the way I like to say it, uh, it's not our preaching that makes the gospel work, it's the gospel that makes our lousy preaching work, right? <laughs> I mean, but there's three ways to preach. There are three, there are th th when, you, when a man stands to preach, he's gonna do one of two things, one of three things. There will be that preaching that ignores the text. It just calls a text and then abandons it. The late A. Lewis Patterson called that great commission preaching. He says great commission preaching is when a man calls the text and then goes into all the world preaching the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's that preaching that ignores the text and then there's that preaching that abuses the text yeah. that preacher hasn't abandoned it he's in it but worse he's twisted it perverted it abusing it to say what he's already predetermined that he wants to say. Sometimes I'm flipping channels and I pass by the TV preacher stations. And I just, I pause because I just want to see because it don't matter what text they own. That sermon's going to end with a seed offering. <laughs> I just want to see this magic trick. Now, no matter what the text is. It's going to land at the same place. You can ignore the text. You can abuse the text. The faithful way to preach is to expose the text. It is to bring out of the text the God-intended meaning of the text. If I may say a word about the preliminaries of expositional preaching, the preliminaries of expositional preaching, let me first just say it is preceded by a divine calling. I don't know about you, brothers. I still believe God calls men to preach. Amen. It is not a vocation that you choose. It is a calling that chooses you. It is the language of You share a pen, I'm gonna hook you up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no words, man. <laughs> um, it is the testimony of 
Paul, necessity has been laid upon you. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Paul asks in another place, how shall they preach unless they be sent? In another place, he says, I'm the least of all the saints. To me, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Another preliminary that I would mention is godly character. Godly character. I think uh, one of the problems of the contemporary church in America is that when it comes to leadership, I feel like we are reaping the consequences of emphasizing gift and de-emphasizing character. Mm -hmm. you, you know the qualifications for Elders in 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, the, there's one skill he needs to be able to teach, but all of the rest of it is character driven. What one does in the ministry is to be the overflow of a life of devotion. My first preaching professor would often talk about the importance of being preachers who he says, were like roots, not pipes. And by that he would, he would explain that water passes through both roots and pipes. But as the water passes through the pipe, it has no positive influence on the pipe. In fact, over time, the pipes rust. But as water passes through the root to the tree, to the vine, the roots get stronger. It was his way of saying that we must be more than just preaching machines who produce sermons, but that our ministry of the word should be the overflow of a life of devotion. We should be as Ezra, Ezra 7 and 10, is the x-ray of the heart of a man of God. Ezra set his heart to do three things. Note that. He set his heart first to study. That's where it begins. Passion to preach without the diligence of preparation is just a desire to perform. It begins with study. But then after he studied it, he didn't rush to find a pulpit. The next step was to do it. He applied it to his own life before he jumped to a pulpit to apply it to others. And then thirdly, he taught God's commands and statutes in Israel. That's, that's an x-ray of the heart of a true man of God. His life is spent studying the word, doing the word, teaching the word. First Timothy chapter four, verse 16, Paul says, keep a close watch on your life and your doctrine. <laughs> I really do think that's the summary of ministry. It's as simple and as difficult as that. Guard your life, guard your teaching. Watch how you live, watch what you teach. That's it, that's all the ministry. You say, oh, HB, that can't be all. You're right. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 16, after you do that, after you guard your life and doctrine, he says, that's not all. After you guard your life and doctrine, hit repeat and persevere in that. It's an ongoing process, a lifelong commitment to ensure your salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. You need biblical convictions. You need to know where you stand and why you stand, Amen. where you stand.
Scripture is necessary. Scripture is necessary. There, there are two ways man seeks to know God. That's by speculation and by revelation. Speculation about God never works. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 tells us that God's thoughts and ways are infinitely beyond God's thoughts and ways. And if that's true, then how can we think God's thoughts after him? Isaiah goes on to tell us in verses 10 and 11. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and don't return there, but water the earth and cause it to spring forth giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Here's the phrase. So shall my word be that comes forth from my mouth. That's what God says about the scriptures. It's, it's my word that proceeds from my mouth. And it is necessary for us to know the will of God, the mind of God, the heart of God. He must reveal himself to us. Scripture is necessary. We believe scripture is inspired. It is breathed out by God. It is authoritative. But well, you should clean that up if you're jotting it down. It is exclusively authoritative. It doesn't share its authority with tradition, councils. The word of God is the last word. It is sufficient. Scripture is sufficient. Standing on the rock, I have the uh, 96 version of that book by um, James Montgomery Boyce. And in it, Boyce talked about the work that they did in the Council of Inerrancy. But in that 96 version of that book, he argued that the battle, he expected the battle for the Bible would continue in the years to come, but would look different. He says the past was a battle for the inspiration of scripture. He predicted the future would be a battle for the sufficiency of scripture. And I think that ominous prediction has come to pass in our generation. We have too many people who will readily affirm the Bible is the word of God and look to everything but scripture. To evangelize the lost, sanctify the church, counsel the trouble, minister to the society. The word of God is sufficient. The word of God is clear. It is clear. Scripture is clear. I believe all of that. That's why I stand to preach with confidence. It's, it's clear. There must be personal commitment. 2 Timothy 2.15. Is that in your outline? Yeah. Would you read that aloud with me, brothers? Ready? Let's read. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Do your best. To present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, right? There are three big questions I often ask from that verse. Maybe you should jot them down and make friends with them. The first question is, is God well pleased with me? Be diligent. Do your best to make sure you are one who God approves. Is God well pleased? Second question, is my work well done? He says, you want to be a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Is God well pleased? Is the work well done? Is the word rightly handled? Rightly divided. The word of truth. Some years ago, uh, we started a preaching conference <laughs> in Jacksonville. And um, there's a sharp young lady who uh, does branding and all of those things and came and spent a day with us. And she said, what do you want to call the conference? I said, I want to call it Cutting It Straight. 
She said, huh? She said, where do you get that from? And I started explaining to her that last clause of 2 Timothy 2.15. She says, HB, that's the problem. She says, you got to explain that. The fact that you got to explain it means the title is too complicated. Uh, they won't get it unless they have that inside knowledge. You need to think of something simpler. And I nodded and sent her home and named it Cutting It Straight. <laughs> <laughs> she later told me we made the right decision. It was the heart of what I, what my concern was. You want to rightly handle the word of truth. Let me talk about the philosophy of expository preaching. And here, let me just kind of work around narrowing toward a, a definition. Let me talk about um, expository preaching distinguished. I want to distinguish it from the other forms of preaching very quickly. It is not topical preaching. I'm at Roman numeral two, the philosophy of expository preaching. I'm at A, expository preaching distinguished. I'm just going to take a moment before we define it to distinguish it from other forms of preaching. It is not topical preaching. Topical preaching is just what it sounds. It starts with the topic and then works its way back to scripture. I hope you see the inherent danger of that. I was a teenager. First time I tried to plow through Kaiser's toward an exegetical theology. I was almost drowning in those pages. But one line that I never forgot that scared the daylights out of me, Kaiser in that book said that a preacher should preach in a, a topical sermon once every five years and then rush and ask God's forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> topical preaching, and I, their exposition can be done topically and biographically and other, other ways. I'm distinct, making the hard distinction of that preaching that starts with a topic, an idea, and then tries to find support text. Right. Or let me say it more clearly, proof text. To argue the idea you've already determined. It's not textual preaching. The difference between textual preaching and expositional preaching is textual preaching focuses on the words. The, the wording of the text. Expository preaching goes deeper than that and focuses on the meaning of the text. I was raised on textual preaching. My father's historical hero is my historical hero, Charles Spurgeon. My father each week basically would take a verse or two, usually a verse, and would just kind of, kind of lift the, like a jewel of gospel implications out of that text. I was, I was saved under that preaching. My faith was nurtured under that preaching. I know many faithful men who preach that way. In fact, um, throughout COVID, basically every week, um, just the minister to my own soul, I was reading a Spurgeon sermon, which are all that way. So it's not an, but it is not exposition. It can fall to the, to where you are, you are, Dealing with the wording of the text, but not dealing with the meaning of the text. When I was a boy, my, my brother introduced me to the writings of Vance Havner, and I just devoured all the Vance Havner stuff I could. And uh, I got in the jam one week in my early first pastorate and stole the ver uh, Vance Havner outline. On a Mark, uh, Mark 4, 35 through 41, Jesus is still in the storm. And uh, I was in the King James Version during those days. And they said, and it, they took him in the ship as he were, and there were other little ships uh, with him. And that was the outline of the Havner message, other little ships. There was that main ship, but there were other little ships. Membership. Stewardship, <laughs> discipleship, fellowship. In my young mind, I said, that'll preach. <laughs> I put that thing together. You couldn't tell me I wasn't on it that day. 
And an old saint walked up to me. Oh, she stood in line to speak to me. And she said, she graciously just cut me to shreds. She just, she said, Pastor, I struggled to keep up. Uh, my Bible says it was other little folks. And if I had a trap door, I could have fell through. <laughs> That's all she said and walked away. And I determined that day, you don't want to preach a sermon where your whole point can be trumped just by a variant translation. <laughs> playing on the wording of the text and not wrestling with the meaning of the text. It's not, it's not narrative, narrative preaching. I, the, the culture of um, one way in the tribe I grew up in in Black Baptist circle, one way to describe good preachers is that he could tell the story. Narrative preaching. Uh, well, well, the Bible is story. And narrative preaching has its place, but expository preaching is not merely the narrative retelling of the story of a text. It's not necessarily biographical preaching. Where you're focusing on the characters. There is a reason, there is a meta narrative, and there is a reason those stories and those personalities are introduced. Why are we introduced to these? What is the purpose of this story? And it's not necessarily a doctrinal preaching. I have some friends that are near to me, but at this point I, I pretty much know what I'm gonna get when they, when I hear them preach. Wherever text they, they, they're, they're at, they're gonna land on their pet doctrines. And I agree. I agree with them doctrinally. Let's see, I'm not sure how they got that out of this. <laughs> I got a buddy, Romeo. Well, if he hears preaching like that and you ask him, how was the sermon? Romel is prone to say, well, he didn't lie on Jesus, but he lied on that text. <laughs> <laughs> and the goal of the faithful preaching is to tell the truth on Jesus and tell the truth on the text. Be expository preaching defined. Expository preaching explains what the text means by what it says. It explains what the text means by what it says. And by that phrase, I just mean text in context. It seeks to explain what the text means by what it says. Seeking to exhort the hearers to trust and obey the God intended message of the text. And so those two verbs in that working definition are significant. Explain and exhort. At its most fundamental essence, expositional preaching should do both. It should explain, it should exhort. That's A. It involves on one hand, explanation. I'm, you may disagree with me, but in the New Testament, I just don't, I don't, I don't get a hard distinction between preaching and teaching. Those words feel to me like they overlap. In 2 Timothy 4, 2, he says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Whatever he was, whatever this understanding Paul had of preaching, it involved teaching. Our preaching should expose the meaning of the text to our people. That explanation should involve the content of the text and the intent of the text. That's expositional preaching. Not, you can, you can be around in the content of the text, 
and not be doing exposition. Exposition seeks to preach not just the content of the text, but the intent of the text. What is the God intended meaning and message of the text? There's explanation and then there's exhortation. So um, in some instances, expository preaching gets a bad rap because what is called expository preaching is not necessarily exposition. But on the other hand, some of what is called expository preaching gets a bad rap because what is called expository preaching is not necessarily preaching. You get what I'm saying? My wife and I were young when we married. And uh, she didn't, she didn't know how to cook and I didn't care. When she started having children, she, she's like, I'm not raising my children on fast food. I'm gonna learn how to cook. Those were the most brutal years of our marriage. <laughs> there were points I thought my wife was intentionally trying to kill me to cook it was so <laughs> bad. But she kept at it till she learned and she's good now. And she, she loves cooking. She loves cooking. And any given day I come home, she's, she's got some video up where she's, she's trying to get me excited. See, look at this video. So, so they tell about this ingredients and then, and, and I play interested because I love my wife, but I couldn't care less. I don't want to see the video. I'm not interested in the recipe. Just call me when the food is done, right? <laughs> and in that regard, I want to say, preaching is not a cooking show. Uh, oh. That's what some people think it is. They get to the pulpit with all of their, their ingredients. And they put on a big display of all of their ingredients. But that's not what expositional preaching is all about. <clears throat> Hungry souls come to church on Sunday morning. They don't want to hear the clamor of pots and pans in the pulpit. They want to smell the aroma of fresh bread. Oh. And so expositional preaching must be more than pulpit exegesis. It should be more than So this day, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I manuscript every message pretty much as word for word as I can. Um, that intentionality guards me from the temptation to try to say every as much as to share everything I'm, I've learned this week. I'm eager about what I've learned, and there are times where my preaching, if I'm not careful, can end up being a data dump, where I just back the truck up. That pulpit and just let the church have everything I done learned that way. And then wonder why they're not more excited about it as I am. But expository preaching is not just text driven, it's um it has a clear message. It involves hermeneutics, homiletics, and human need. Hermeneutics is the facts of the sermon. You need to get the, that's the biblical concern of the teacher. You want to get the facts of the text right. You want to tell the truth on Jesus and the text. Homiletics is the form of the sermon. That's the practical concern of the preacher. And human need is the function of the sermon. What are you trying to do to these people? Facts, form, and function. I have, a, um, I have a friend, if you ask him how long a sermon should be, his answer is a sermon should be, he's not gonna give you a time, his answer 
is going to be that a sermon should be as long as you can maintain purpose, unity, and movement. But I think that's a good way to describe a clear message. A clear message has purpose. It has unity. The various elements of the sermon all work together to serve the purpose. And it has movement. It is obvious that this message is moving to a logical conclusion. We say a word about the power of expositional preaching. I'm at Roman numeral three. I'll go through some of this quickly so I can just kind of get to talking talk shop a little bit with you. Um, it begins, and I, I just kind of want to repeat what I've said before here. It begins with the personal sanctification of the preacher. The personal sanctification of the preacher. Your, your preparation to preach starts with the life that you live. There's power there. Also the biblical worldview of the preacher. You need to be ready to preach what, why, and how. Preach what the text says, that's exposition. But preach why, and by that I mean, I think faithful preaching in the day we live in needs to be apologetic. Our people need to not only understand what they believe, but why. They need to, in the language of 1, 1 Peter 3.15, to be ready to give an answer or defense to anyone that asks them the reason why they have placed their hope in Christ. Preach what, which deals with exposition. Preach why, which deals with apologetics. Preach how, which deals with application. And I'll, I'll be honest, that's the other reason I write, I write full manuscripts. It, it, I need to be intentional about exhortation and application. My bent is just to explain. And I need to prayerfully think through application. And uh, writing myself clear aids me in that process. The public ministry of the preacher public ministry of the preacher. Have I lost you yet? I'm at 3C. We're talking about Roman number three, the power of expositional preaching. A was the personal sanctification of the preacher. B is the biblical worldview of the preacher. What? Why and how? I'm at 3C, the public ministry of the preacher. I think expository preaching is a key part of the ex, the public ministry of the pastor. Which I, I think our public ministry involves three areas. Music, prayer, and preaching. Music, prayer, and preaching. Music, yes. I, I think the pastor teacher has a responsibility as it relates to music. Because Colossians 3.16 teaches at least this, that music in worship is an extension of the ministry of the word. That the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Warning and teaching, warning and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Amen. I also pastor in a culture where 
if I just could say it bluntly, gospel music has been kidnapped by prosperity theology. So I am intentional about what I am. I'm not an expert in music, but I'm, I plan my preaching. God willing, tomorrow afternoon, we have a weekly worship planning meeting, and I plan my preaching in advance so that the preaching of the word is the anchor around which we talk about what we will sing. That's my doorway into music. What we, what we preach should shape what we sing. And that helps me to just steward that responsibility so that we are not preaching one thing and singing another. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, um, I picked up a book. I'm going to, God willing, give it to the music team tomorrow. I picked up copies of a book. Um, Theolo on, on worship called Theology That Sticks. That's an that's a interesting, good title. In, in a way, what we teach in music sticks more than what we teach in preaching. Because the, what we teach in music is woven into a melody that sticks with the congregation when they leave. They'll remember what they sing as it is woven in that melody They'll remember that long after they forget those three points you were working so hard to alliterate. <laughs> Prayer. Prayer. I, I wish I had more time to talk about this, but I, one of the things God has helped me to take more seriously in my pastoring over the past year or two in COVID is to be more intentional in preparing myself to lead in that pastoral prayer on Sunday mornings. So much so that my church doesn't put pressure on me to say something when something arises. I don't do a lot of statements on everything that's happening, but they will ex they expect me to be praying about it. And in the pastoral prayer, I'm praying specifically and I'm finding out that praying about it is more helpful than talking about it. Hello. <laughs> and then preaching. Music, prayer, and preaching. Really, my pastoral philosophy is just second, is, is Acts 6 4. I think the the commitment of the apostles is the model for the pastor. We should devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. I mean, that's how I understand my ministry. I just, my, my personal time with members, counseling, visitation, I, I just view that as I have, I have, there's a private devotion to prayer and ministry of the word. I do that privately with my people and I do it publicly with my people. But the, but the ministry is driven by prayer and the ministry of the word. I'm reading Daniel Henderson's book, uh, uh, Old, Old Paths to New Power. And he's just arguing that if revival is going to come to the church, the next new thing needs to be the old first thing. Prayer and the ministry of the word. Amen. I agree with that. We just devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Which is more important, HB? Prayer and the or the ministry of the word? Well, if you're 30,000 feet in the air, what's more important, the left wing or the right wing? Either one of them malfunction, you in trouble. D, the pastoral leadership of the preacher. I'm, I'm old enough at this point. I was reflecting with a friend just last week. That 
I, I started ministry where that was just, you could barely find anything on preaching. In the bookstore in my hometown, there's a little thing with it, a couple of books on preaching, sermon helps, and then pastoral helps. It was whole and all the books on church growth. And most of the ideas of church growth was just business principles and religious terminology. Hello. And I want to suggest to you that expositional preaching is not just pulpit work. It should, the word of God should shape how we lead. You will short circuit faithful preaching if the word is the basis upon which you preach, but business principles shape the basis by which you lead. You should live as a preacher, you should labor as a preacher, and you should lead as a preacher. The word of God should govern your philosophy of ministry. The word of God should govern. In our leadership meetings, in our deacons meetings, our elders meetings, there should be the expectation that you as the pastor talking about the word of God. The long-term effectiveness of the preacher. I just, I believe there's just power. In expositional preaching. This past Sunday, I, I ended on, uh, I ended Mark chapter 10. I'm preaching through the gospel of Mark. Yeah. Y'all know, brothers, this is a really big book. <laughs> yeah. Got five more chapters in Mark and beginning to pray about God willing what I'll tackle next. Usually after our New Testament book, I head to an Old Testament book. Uh, and I don't feel any pressure about preaching getting stale. Because I still got a lot of terrain ahead of me. It's a big book. And if you're running from topic to topic, if that's, if that's what shapes your preaching, finding a, a topic every week, something creative to say, you're going to run out of gas that way. You're going to preach yourself into some dead end. But oh, the open terrain of biblical preaching just stirs me up. I'm embarrassed to say this is the first time I preached through a gospel, but it had made me bold. I think I want to go to Genesis after this. <laughs> I done got, I got boldness now <laughs> to take on something like that. Uh, and I, I will just throw this in about expositional preaching. I believe this is also my because I have five more chapters. I think Sunday was my 56th sermon out the Gospel of Mark. Um, and church is not complaining. Hey, because you know, I just told my friend, every text got Jesus in it. If you get bored with Jesus, that's all. Okay. But I, I don't, people say, well, people have short memory. And I have friends, say, oh, I, I, no longer than four or six weeks. I just don't believe that. I believe people get used to what they're used to. But I also think, and one of my models, um, I was learning to preach and sitting in the back of Grace Community Church. And um, every week, the first part of the sermon was a review of last week's sermon. And I said, boy, if I tried that in my church, I'd empty that joint out. <laughs> That's not everybody. I do think you can preach a longer series. Every sermon needs to be able to stand on its own. This is why I think homiletical form is important. I am factoring in where we are in the progression of the text. But, but in a real sense, Sunday's message is a standalone sermon. You don't have to be there with us for three months to get the point of Sunday's sermon. 
Amen. Amen. I'm at Roman number four, the process. I'm going to just give you the fill-ins here without, hopefully just without commentary. And I just want to talk to you about what my personal process is. In terms of, um, so you can get all the fill-ins. In terms of the process of expositional preaching, there's formal training, which is just vital. Vital for three reasons, I think. Biblical languages, systematic theology, and church history. B is private devotion. And yes, um, I'm trying to study each week devotionally. Because I'm going to spend my life that week with the text. It can't just be a mechanical process. I, I, I want to study devotionally so it's feeding my soul. But I also have a separate process of daily devotions so that I am having a time in the word with God that is not utilitarian. A time in the word that is not tied to anything else except my being with God and, and having my soul refreshed in his word and in prayer. Private devotions involves prayer, Bible intake, and I would recommend, brothers, one of the things that has been spiritually helpful for me is just a commitment to scripture, to scripture memorization. Mm -hmm. Scripture memorization. So A, I was mentioning a formal training, which involves biblical language, systematic theology, church history, private devotions, which involves prayer, Bible intake, and scripture memorization. Scheduled time. And I, I just, scheduled time just means you need to schedule your time for preparation and guard that time. Whatever that looks like for you. You have, you have commitments in, on your schedule that you are going to honor. You need to also schedule that time to prepare. I have a friend, uh, Ray, who has a website where he puts all of his sermons, manuscripts, post a new one every week. And he says over the course of the week, <laughs> he's like, the traffic is just dead and it shoots up on Saturdays. <laughs> and you know why. Um, you can't do faithful exposition preaching Saturday night specials. I just, after all these years of preaching, it's hard. And it's not hard in terms of difficulty. It's hard in terms of time. It's time intensive and you can't rush the process if you are going to genuinely come to an understanding of God's word, let it minister to your heart and shape well the message for preaching. Generally, I, my, my process in terms of the scheduling of my week is just what the old fellas used to say. I try to spend my mornings with God, my afternoon with my people and my evenings with my family. But the time when you are at your best is when you should give yourself to study. Consecrated place, study tools. D is consecrated place, study tools. Study tools of Bible translations, language tools, reference books. Forgive me for going fast. I, I kind of want to just make sure I get a moment to talk to you about what I, what I do. Bible translations, language tools, reference books, Bible commentaries, and theological works need to be a part of your library. Bible translations, language tools, reference books, Bible commentaries, and theological works need to be a part of your library. If a young guy 
You need to make that decision early, physical or digital. I'm a dinosaur. I gotta have a book. If, I gotta have a book. <laughs> I'm grateful for all of the conveniences of the technology. I'm a dinosaur. And uh, I don't have a library. I have tools. Every workman has tools. My books are my tools that I work with each week. I want to learn them well. In terms of my the personal system, whatever your system is, it should involve three things. Read, record, and reflect. You should read widely. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's physical or digital. You're still going to do the work of reading. They haven't made software to do the reading for you. You got to take it in. That's a discipline. You need to read widely. This is, I think you should record diligently. There are a lot of things I would do differently. One of the things I would do differently from a young preacher now is I read a lot as a young preacher. I just didn't write anything down. And there's just a whole period of my preaching that's gone. I think it's in my system, but I have no record of it because I wasn't writing anything down. I'm a little, I'm way more intentional of not just reading widely, but recording diligently, keeping a record of what I, I'm studying, what I'm learning. And then you need time to reflect prayerfully. This is another reason why you need to schedule your time and use that time wisely and start as early as you can. Because you need time. My wife was learning to cook, if I could mention that again. And at times I come home from work and she's got everything laid out and I'm going to shower. I'm like, oh, this, this looks like she's doing this thing. I'm looking forward to whatever this is. And I, I shower up and come out and all that stuff is put up and she's asking what we're doing for dinner. And I say, I said, baby, what was all that you had out? She saw, she say, that's not for the, the day. I was marinating that for tomorrow. Marinate, I, we, we gotta eat tonight. <laughs> what you were, and then the next day I tasted that marinated food. And I said, marinate on, baby, marinate on. <laughs> but there's a sense in which our preparation is aided by having time to just meditate on. Times you just, there are times you just struggle trying to get a thought and then get away for, from it for a few hours. And it's, God is still ministering to you. It's working in your subconscious and you just needed a time away. But if you are not using that time why, wisely, you don't have time to prayerfully reflect on what you have studied. Um, my process, as I, I'm preaching through, um, books of the Bible on um, Sunday mornings, as I mentioned, I'm preaching through the gospel of Mark. Um, Wednesday nights, I'm preaching through first John um, currently. I, I have a cart for first John in my study and a cart for Mark. And um, someone helps me to make copies for each text. I've divided up the text um, with reference stuff so that um, wherever I am, if I have to travel, if I decide to work from home, I have basically in that file what I need um, to get through my work. I, I, I start by typing out the text. Um, and that I have copies of that with me wherever I go. And I'm just marking, I'm reading and rereading and I'm doing observation constantly. But I'm also, I, I want to, I'm meditating on that text. I'm also trying to memorize it over the course of the week. Um, Monday, I'm just kind of, I made 
for me, I'm just kind of looking over that file, just kind of organizing that file that's been prepared for me and slowly reading the text. I'm, I'm trying to recover from Sunday. So Monday, I'm just slowly reading. Um, Tuesday, I want to get into to observations. Um, so I have no exotic process. I'm, I'm using the inductive study Bible method. So I am starting with um, observations. Um, I just call this, you know, sanctified brainstorming. I'm just thinking myself empty. I start with a, a empty page and I'm just making notes of what I observe. Questions, connections, sentence diagrams, um, repeated words until I have thought myself empty. I want to just make a footnote there that the more time I spend doing that, I feel like the better my preparation goes. There's always the temptation to cheat that process. Um, I read, I read um, two weeks ago, Andy Nasali's new book on how to understand, how to interpret and apply the New Testament. Found it excellent. Um, But he said in there, and I agree with that, an hour of observation with the primary text is worth 10 hours with secondary sources. I just want to spend time with the text. Um, I am going to observe just um, different translations. Um, it's keying in the words I need to really lean into. I'm also benefiting from different language. I study privately, memorize scripture, and teach publicly from the English Standard Version. Um, but there are multiple translations in the pews in my church. And uh, I got precious saints. That they ain't letting go of their King James version. <laughs> uh, so I'm just factoring factoring that in early in my in my process of doing word studies. Um, after that, Wednesday I'm kind of backing out of that process because I need to kind of think through. Wednesdays is for my Wednesday night. Thursday is my heavy day of lifting. Um, a key part for me is also. Um, is um, cross-reference. Treasury of scripture knowledge is one of my dearest friends. I believe in the analogy of faith. I believe scripture interprets scripture. And I think it's an effective way of preaching to argue scripture with scripture. So that is a significant part. When I get to um, my, my resources, I start, there's a time I wouldn't mention this, but I start with um, study Bibles. I have about 10 study Bibles and I, I just glance at them. Um, they're written at a very popular level. And it just kind of gives me an eye on what, my, what, what might catch my members' attention while they're reading the text. Um, and then I'm gonna work through commentary um, and I'm going to read three sets of three kinds of commentary. I'm going to read the exegetical commentary. I'm going to read some homiletical commentary. Um, I mean, that's, that's my struggle. Um, I am aided to see how men, I don't, I'm not trying to steal anybody's work, but I am aided to, by seeing how men put their arms around the text for preaching. So homiletical commentaries aid me in that. And I'm reading devotional commentaries. I'm, I'm reading each week on Mark. I'm reading Harry Ironside, J.C. Ryle. They're more devotional in some regards, but it's helping me think about trains of application, tracks of application, I should say. Then uh, I, am, I am at the end of that process, and hopefully at the end of Thursday, I'm setting a... Um, Sermon skeleton, where I kind of 
landed now on what the shape of this message will be. When I, when I, by that, when I have kind of, well, I'm a preacher, I can just say it bluntly. I don't feel, I don't, I'm not, when I, when I get an outline, I feel like I'm ready. <laughs> I may know the text, but I need until I'm comfortable with the outline. So my goal Thursday is to get get to the outline, and then I'm going to write a full manuscript on Fridays, as I mentioned. And I, then at some point, I'm going to pare it down. This stage, I want to pare it down to a few notes for the pulpit. Um, Mm, I would like to be done. It doesn't always work that way. We have a Saturday morning prayer meeting at eight o'clock and a part of our prayer meeting each week is to pray for the ministry of the word the next day. So I, I want to be, I want to be, want to kind of just give a nugget from the message in that prayer meeting so they can be specifically praying for Sunday's, Sunday's message. Um, but I'm still, this weekend, my wife, Saturday was like, Mr. Charles, just leave the sermon alone before you mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm still, I, I, have a, I have a hard time letting go. Uh, I have a hard time sleeping on Saturday night. I'm eager to preach. And I am still touching on stuff and editing and the, 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 the whole way. Um, and in that regard, uh, that's not too much exotic. I preach uh, twice on Sunday mornings, not much to do on Saturday after Sunday afternoons, and my, my church pretty much lets me rest and recover on, on Mondays to, to do it. Polishing on Saturday night. Polishing is a good way. Polishing is a good way. I preach at two locations on Sunday, on Sundays, and uh, a lot of the Sundays, riding from one location to the other, I'm typing because I, I found a way to say it better in the first sermon. <laughs> so I don't forget it. I'm putting it in, in a man. It is hard to let go. But we are preaching the living word of God and it deserves our best. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hope some of that was helpful to you. Let me let me let me pray. Um, I am. Um, let me pray. Father, thank you for this time together. I know we've tried to discuss much in a short amount of time, but I pray, Father, that um, something that has been said you would use to be helpful and encouraging and challenging to these men to give themselves more fully and faithfully to the holy work of biblical preaching. Thank you for your condescending grace that would use people like us to do something as important as this. You deserve our best. Your word demands that we labor to rightly handle it in public teaching. Help us, Lord, to live your word, following hard after Jesus Christ, observing what he has commanded us. To proclaim him, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom that we may present everyone mature, complete, perfect in Christ. Thank you for everyone gathered today and for every family and ministry represented here, Lord. I pray for each of us that every sphere of our lives, every aspect of our lives would be brought under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that our service for you would be the overflow of our heart's devotion to Christ. And that as it would please you, that you would use us to proclaim the gospel Build up your people in our most holy faith and advance your kingdom causes in the world. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. If you want to eat, you need to get a ticket at the front desk. And then slip through that door and down there. Then you can get your plate of food and you can bring it back here. There's a beverage dispenser here. Thank you for being here. And we will resume our time together with Dr. H.P. Charles Jr. at the top of the hour. You're dismissed.